All right. Good evening, everyone, and a belated happy Thanksgiving to all and happy holiday season to everyone because we know that that starter's pistol has been fired with Black Friday. So we know exactly what's going on from this point forward. Guard your wallets, although you all know that that has no chance of happening. But I wish you all success and happiness. My name is Charles Davis. Welcome to the latest Ethos Village webinar. Happy to be the host and the moderator. We've got an incredible panel of speakers for you tonight to discuss legacy, the discussion of strong relationships between parents and student athletes. And it's gonna be a fun discussion. It's gonna be an informative discussion and an enlightening discussion, I know. And let me introduce you to our panelists for this evening. First up, it's a man by the name of Mike Singletary. And when he was playing football, they called him Samurai Mike. Pro Football Hall of Famer, Super Bowl champion, coach in the NFL, now high school coach, Trinity Christian Academy in Dallas, Texas. And that's where Mike Singletary and the great Michael Davis met and got introduced to Ethos Education Group. Also with us tonight is Tim Brown, NFL Hall of Famer and an Ethos partner. Marcus Simeon, currently the starting shortstop with the Oakland A's, drafted in 2011 in the sixth round by the White Sox from Cal Berkeley. And Michael, make sure I get all these notes in there. It's the same college where Marcus's father, Damian, went to school and Michael Davis also attended. So I'm not at Cal Berkeley. You will hear that a lot tonight. High school, St. Mary's College High School. Oh, by the way, the same high school Michael Davis attended. Amazing how that worked out. Now married to Tara Murray. Two boys, Isaiah, three and a half, Joshua, two and a half. We welcome Marcus. We also have Damian Simeon, father of Marcus Simeon, played in the Canadian Football League, and a teammate with Michael Davis at Cal Berkeley. Dr. Scott Brooks is with us, associate professor at Arizona State University, director of the Global Sports Institute. And by the way, went to college with Michael Davis at Cal Berkeley. Um, also with us is uh, Ms. Sheila Weaver, former Union College coach and administrator, Recognized by District of Columbia State Athletic Association as a 2020 inductee into the DCSAA High School Hall of Fame. Another illustrious award for her. Founder of signmetoplay.com, mother of two daughters, one of which was a professional volleyball player. And guess what? Cousin to Michael Davis. I'm loving this. This is outstanding. You know, I've got to give Sly and the Family Stone going back there singing it's a family affair. We also have a couple of special guests tonight. Black College Football Hall of Famer and eventual Pro Football Hall of Famer, Mr. Everson Walls, and also Kevin Williamson. Kevin was an Ethos student in high school before he went on to play at Clemson University. After graduation, worked for the New York Knicks as a physical therapist and later opened up his own business called PWR Performance. Continues to teach at Ethos Workshops as an Ethos alumni. So we greatly welcome both of them. You will hear from Kevin near the end of our discussion tonight. So let me go ahead and get things kicked off here because there's so much to dive into. And when we're talking about defining legacy, Michael, I'm gonna bring you up first as the, as, as, as the leader of all this. Let me, you get us started, please, with what your definition of legacy would be, and then we'll throw this around for our other panelists. Great. Thank you, Charles. Uh, go Bears. Let me put that out there right now for all my Golden Bears. We didn't get to ask, but that's are, all right. You, are you okay? Because, you know, I saw that <laughs> hurt right before, now, hurt. and I wasn't sure we were going to have this have this event after no I saw that. You. I thought you might be, uh, might be hurting a little. Go ahead. We got past it. Uh, so, so yeah, legacy, I think for us is when we talk about identity, uh, purpose, values, and vision, I think you have to talk about those three elements to begin to talk about your purpose in life, uh, understanding what God's defined uh, idea is for you to be here, uh, and, and really start to understand the narratives that are out there that are written about some black and brown, white kids in particular too, that, that they can only do certain things, be successful in certain you know, occupations or certain sectors of business. And we want them to really understand that they can leave a legacy by way of, again, their identity, understanding how they see themselves, their purpose in life, and then setting those values and, and vision as far as their goals. So that's what we really define legacy to be. I think everybody's been invited here 
definitely has words about legacy. Um, Marcus, obviously, um, seeing all that go through from son to father and now being uh, a father himself uh, and having other people of generational wisdom be able to speak to our kids uh, about legacy and what that all means. So that's how I will start it off. Well, now that we have that on the table as a, as a baseline, Coach Weaver, I'm going to ask you, how does one's identity and purpose drive legacy as Michael described it to us? You have to unmute there, Coach Weaver. We, we need to hear you. Okay. There we go. All right. I think once you um, have found your purpose, that purpose helps you to uh, really hone in on, on your identity, how you see uh, yourselves and how you see other people and how you can help uh, people also find their own way to uh, establishing your own legacy because you've had a number of experiences that you can then rely upon and also offer the offer others advice that they may be kind of stumbling around trying to figure out well what is it that I need to do how can I do it so if you have a legacy that's built on wanting to be uh, helpful understanding and, and really kind the others and you're going to seek out those who are trying to really find their way in life so I think that's one of the key points in um, what your legacy is is it going to be good is it going to be uh, not good is it going to be something that you really don't uh, think about at all and a lot of people don't think about their legacy they just kind of wander around in life and then here I am so. Marcus Simeon you have an identity as a starting shortstop in Major League Baseball how do you take that identity and create a legacy? Uh, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, I, I really think that it's about setting an, an example. Uh, for me, I had a good example. My father, he was a, a professional athlete, collegiate athlete, student athlete, and father at the same time. Uh, he was real young when he had me. And just for him to you know, keep his stuff together and get through everything and 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 get his, his schoolwork done, get his, you know, his sports done that day. Um, you know, it's just having a good example and knowing that he did all that for me, you know, it makes me want to go out there and work hard because he did it. And now you want to set an example for the young people who come behind you. I think that's what a legacy is, in, in my opinion. Dad, Simeon, Damien, when you hear that, what are your thoughts? Um, it's, it's, it's pretty exciting. Uh, forgive me. We're having some technical difficulties over here trying to get myself on. I got my, my younger daughter, Vanessa, she's trying to help well, we me hear you, her. which is a good thing. So you go right ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's an honor to be here. I mean, I see a lot of the names on here. I see a good friend, an old friend, Mike Davis over there. We played, uh, went to college together, played together. I see my son over there mm -hmm. and I he heard some of the words that he said and, uh, um, kind of hit me a little bit, but yeah, he hit it on the head, man. It was a, it was a life experience that I'll never forget. You know, like you said, being a college athlete and, uh, raising a son at the same time, along with his mother, you know, it, it built a lot of, I, what I feel character in both of us. And it just kept us, kept us on course to see that he, and it, uh, to see that Marcus stayed on course along with my other kids. And uh, it, it was an experience that I'll never forget, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. And nor should you. You guys have done quite well, to put it mildly. I've got Thanks. two pro football Hall of Famers that I want to bring in on this. I'm going to start with Mike Singletary. You guys have an identity, obviously, as tremendous football players and people that we still, you know, we turn on NFL Network and we see video and highlights of your careers pretty much nightly. And you guys get discussed, but... You also built a legacy, not just as ball players. Mike Singletary, could you talk to us, please, about what it's like with your journey, what it's like being you and not just being that pro football player that we love to watch on Sundays? Well, I think, um, you know, being a, being a dad, uh, being a husband, um, and then being, I guess a lot of people would call it an entertainer, uh, even though I look at that very differently. 
But I, I, I think um, it's really important in life to really say, this is who I am. This is who I want to be. You're making the decision. You're being intentional about um, this is who I want to be. And then being true to that. Saying that this is who I want to be is one thing, but then being able to walk that out, being true to that, um, it, it is making sure that uh, my intentions are, are consistent with my behavior. And to, to me, that is when you begin to live out uh, a legacy uh, without really thinking about it. it. It is taking it one day at a time and making sure that I'm intentional about who it is that I say I am, not just having a reputation, but really having the character to back it up. Tim Brown, you there for me? Is Tim there? Not yet. All right, I'm gonna move on then. Dr. Brooks, you've heard a lot from our panelists to get things going to hear what they're talking about in terms of legacy, who they are as people, what they're trying to transmit to their loved ones and others around them. What are your thoughts about everything that's going on? And let's face it, every time we do one of these webinars, we have to frame it with 2020, COVID, everything that's going on in our world, racial, social injustice, how do you put it all together so we can create those legacies and create those identities for people coming up through the ranks? Well, you know, I, I think that it's, it's all of the things that we talked about, right? That you can be deliberate. Um, you, you're hearing from great leaders who, who have an identity. They establish a purpose early. They then go about and they're, they're methodical, they're uh, disciplined, and they're really walking the talk. I think that one of the other things that goes maybe a little bit understated is that we know the babies are always watching us, right? Your kids are always watching. And so it's not just those things that we intend for them to see. It's also those things we do not intend for them to see that also have an impact on legacy. And, you know, I, I'll give you a very brief thing. Um, speaking with my sons at 20 and 23 the other day, they are all in this house because of COVID, right? We're all in here together. Um, you know, I, I'm the short one in my family, which means they're six, five and a half and six, five. And they've been in a room sharing a bedroom uh, for, for most of the pandemic. And what the younger one said to me was, we have learned a safe word when we get, when we get at each other, right? And their safe word is my father's name that's a legacy, right? That one thing that they hold dear, my father passed away in March, is that there are things that are so important, like family, that all we gotta do is say our grandfather's name and that puts things into perspective. That's a legacy, right? It's not necessarily anything he did deliberately. It's just how he walked it. So when I think of, of what we're talking about, that leading is deliberate, it goes you know, there's some purpose, there's our identity, but it's also just walking that, walking that walk, right? Doing, being, treating others the way as our grandmothers, our mothers told us, treating others the way that you want to be treated, right? That's part of leaving that legacy. And in this moment, when we're learning, right, how do we deal with each other? And we're up underneath each other. We don't have the same freedoms that we, we've had. We have to show each other more grace, right? And so the legacy that we're leaving behind to these young folks is how all of us have managed in this pandemic, how all of us have managed in this reawakening, this, this, the second pandemic, right, which is this race, this thing that we've all lived, but now our country is re, reawakening to that. How are we responding? Are we responding with grace as people are trying to find their way, right, and how do we get along? So I think it's pulling all these things together, but to remember that it's the intentional and the unintentional. Love it. All right. I have some, this is going to be for, for so many of you, but I'll tell you where I'm going to start is after I lay it out. Little league parents. It all of a sudden became a term where 
the parents who have worked so hard, helped their kids, put them along the right path. Somehow it got crazy, right? And everybody's talking about little league parents are driving us all nuts and they're too much and they're this and they're that. But let's face it, a whole lot of us wouldn't be here without our parents giving us the right push, put us in the right direction. So Coach Weaver, I'm going to start with you because as someone who was a coach, you had to deal not just with your student athletes. I know mom and dad wanted to get involved at certain times too. How did you put that all together and still maintain, you know, you being the coach, them being the student athlete, and mom and dad being where they're supposed to be, cheering them on from the stands? Well, as you know, the parents are, are extremely important to your program. So you, you, and you know, you want to keep them happy, but you also have to keep them understanding that their role is to be supportive of the coaches, of the student athletes, and of the program. And that sometimes is a dilemma because uh, many times parents have uh, uh, unrealistic expectations uh, about their kids, about the program, about what what's what the re end result is going to be. There's going to be a scholarship. There's going to be uh, more of the awards, the accolades, and sometimes they forget the uh, the values that are instilled in sports through the sportsmanship and just the, the unity and the need for uh, understanding because you're not always gonna be a, a winner and you also have to know how to be a gracious loser. And so these are the things that parents sometimes on the surface, they know this is true, but oftentimes it gets lost in the, sh in the, in the whole um, program. So you gotta keep that in mind and make sure that they understand their role without stepping on anyone's toes. And, and Damian Simeon, Coach, Coach Weaver just laid it out and she's not saying every parent is bad. Most of them have the best of intentions or doing all these things. You had it from a different perspective because you now have a young man playing Major League Baseball, which for all of us parents who have kids and you're not the only one, right? And obviously that's like the Holy Grail. So there's a lot right that went on to get this done. What was your journey like being a pop father of an athlete who had such gift, has so many gifts and such promise along the way? Um, it's, it's, it's been an exciting journey, even to this moment. Um, I have real fond memories of Marcus from the minute he started playing t-ball. And uh, like, like we're saying, I had to kind of find my role because back then I was still had that competitive fire in myself and I had to make sure I kind of kept everything under wraps. I mean, we talking about a kid that's five, six years old. And I'm thinking, you know, in my mind, go ahead and hit it 300 feet. But you got to kind of keep it under control. I always told myself I didn't want to be that dad that was pushing and pushing and, you know, having his son or, or like I said, I got daughters also to the point where you push them to where they're crying and they take the, the love is taken from it. All of my kids, they, they learn the love their particular sport on their own, which was a great relief for me because once I saw how much they loved it, that's when it's that's when you know to kind of they're going to find their own path in it. And so um, it, it was again, it was a fond memory. Again, I'm going through it with my younger daughter. She's a, she's very passionate about it, just like Marcus was. And I just I just sit back and enjoy it again. Back when Marcus was doing it, I just sat back and enjoyed it. Gave him pointers here or there, but you know he picked it up pretty quick. And I didn't want to be that that guy that pushed that kid too far because that's when you get nothing but trouble. Marcus, you hang in there because I'm coming to you because your dad has spoken now. But I've got to ask Mike Singletary. You've seen it from every side. You've got kids as well. What are your thoughts about the not just the role of parents, but when you see it executed well? What do you see? Um, I think, uh, for the most part, when, um, when I look at parents that, that are trying to help their kids, I think every parent has to decide at some point in time, when do I pull away? I mean, obviously if my kid is five, six, seven, eight, um, I know my kid. My kid comes from, from home and they have certain mannerisms and things like that. 
um, that that I need to I, I need to make sure that the coach understands. Um, but as a parent, it's important for me to know when I need to step back and really have a relationship with the coach, and uh, just to make sure that that coach understands as I wean myself off of that. To uh, that that coach understands, I'm in a partnership with you with my child. And hopefully the goal is not about winning at that age. It is about helping our, our, our young kids uh, have a healthy um, uh, experience. And if they can do that, then we, we can come away with, it, with a win-win situation, whether they ever play again after that or not. Uh, but it's knowing that uh, we had a great experience. And to me, that, that's what matters the most. Marcus, you heard dad talk and you're not in that stage yet. I don't believe where you are bringing along a youngster as dad and mom brought you along. But now that you have some perspective, what was it like? How did mom and dad do it with you? And what are your takeaways from how they brought you along and, and, and what you might move on to your legacy when it's your turn? And Michael Davis, hang in there because I've got to ask you a couple a question about this as well. Yeah, I think my dad uh, hit it right on the head. I, he, he never had to motivate me to go to practice or to work on my game. I played basketball a little bit, but baseball was my thing. And um, for me, I felt like I had to probably put more work into basketball to just to, to hang out there. So I would be working on jump shots on my own. He never told me once. The only thing he told me to do was probably do push-ups or something at night or just have a routine where you, you know, you build strength. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad because I don't want to be that parent either to, to push my kids um, so hard that they don't want to do it anymore. I want them to experience what I've been able to experience as a professional athlete, as a collegiate athlete, an amateur athlete. Like that's what, you know, this is my goal. I, I, my goal was to become a major league baseball player and I accomplished that. Now I've built new goals, but you know, I, I don't want to tell them that needs to be your goal. I want them to figure it out themselves. Um, you know, and I think that what Mr. Uh, Brooks said, Scott Brooks said was just amazing. You know, what he, what he said about, you know, how his kids are in that legacy and setting an example and, you know, his grandfather, um, Mr. Brooks, I'm sure he, you know, that's their safe word. That, that is amazing just hearing that story. And I, I would love for my, my sons to, to have something like that because, um, you know, that, that really hit me hard. Yeah, that's big time stuff. Michael, we got a great question from someone who's, who's watching and what they want to know, and here you are as, as the head of Ethos Education Group, so you see it from every perspective. How can the parents form a really good partnership with the people coaching their kids so that it is collaborative, if, if, if that's the proper word, and productive so that everybody gets the best out of everything? How, what's the best way you can see that happening? Um, you know, I think first and foremost, you know, every every parent is is different and i think that um uh, as a coach is is so important that uh, as you deal with the parent that you really look at the kid uh because sometimes um uh, a parent is coming from another place uh you have to detect really early on uh if if the parent really has the best kids the the, the best interest for of the kid uh, a lot of times uh, the parent is there to, they want to see their kid be great. And it's like, um, you, you know, uh, when you play this game, um, whether it's baseball or football or whatever, you know when, when a kid is self-motivated and you know when a kid cannot wait to get this over with. Um, so as a coach, you have to spot that early on and, and realize, you know what, I, I've got to help this parent. Um, are they willing to develop a partnership where, hey, tell me if you think something's wrong. Tell me if, if uh, your kid needs something more from me. 
And, and then um, you have to know which parent to be able to say certain things to. So there's a lot of wisdom that goes, in, that goes into it, uh, especially in today's time, because there's so many other, it's not just as simple as parent, kid, coach. It's not that simple. There are a lot of other things that go into it. And as a coach, you got to be surrounded by other people that, that support you and make sure that uh, you don't go too far out on the limb trying to help the kid or the parent and, and leave yourself out there exposed. Michael Davis, yep. Lauren McKinney has given us some really good questions here. That was, that was her question there. And here's a second part to her question. Mm -hmm. In the triad partnership between coach, parent, and athlete, what responsibility does each bear? Great question. Um, I, I think it's really about alignment. What comes to mind when I talk about the, the vertical alignment with parent and coach and child, uh, you, you have to talk about how the, you, the expectations are when you talk about uh, the situation between uh, mom and dad. Their expectations may be totally different than the son or the daughter. And a lot of times what coach was talking about, you know, a, a, a son and a daughter, they want to love their 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 parent um they want to please their parent and sometimes they're out there playing the sport because that's something that dad did and that's something that he feels that there's a connection with dad or mom by way of their sport they don't like the sport but they want love from mom and dad so you have to decipher again the alignment of all three parties to make sure we're all talking the same language uh, and the same expectations are there across the board once you once you're not aligned then you start to have chaos in the family. You start to have chaos in the relationship between coach, parent, and, and student athlete. So I think those are the pieces that I would say, once you understand the alignment and the purpose of why these kids are there, why the coach is there, why the parents are there, the student athlete, then I think you can start to really uh, foster good union and partnership. Dr. Brooks, as people chase their dreams, players, you know, student athletes, parents, coaches, all of them working together, chasing your legacy, forming your identity. We never talked about mental health in the, in the, in the, in the, what I call the good old days. Right. Okay. Cause I'm 56. So when I played, if you even walked into a coach's office and said, you know, I don't know mental health, you know, that you know, that was fraught with disaster. But as you chase this and form this, can those types of issues arise in any direction as people are trying to get there? A absolutely. You know, I, I think of, you know, to Michael Davis's uh, point, when we're talking about being in alignment or out of alignment, what we're really wanting to know is, you know, how, are, how has this kid been poured into? What have they seen? Um, and so if they are trying to fulfill this, this need for love that they didn't feel they got from their parents, or they're trying to prove themselves in these particular ways, you know, when they have to deal with adversity, like your career has come to an end due, due to COVID, um, you know, you've had a, a, an injury that's ended your career, how they will, how they will respond is connected to how they were brought up. Right and 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 how they see themselves? Do they see themselves as something beyond an athlete? Do they feel as though their parents are still going to love them unconditionally? Um, and then the same thing with a coach. Coaches play such an important role for for our kids of color. Uh, you know they're a part of that village. They pour into them, and there's nothing greater, I believe, than having someone who is not your blood tell you that they love you, tell you that they believe in you seeing something in you that you don't see in yourself. And so that coach has that opportunity to do that. And if we don't know exactly what it is that is pushing them, that's motivating them, we're not going to be able to help them when they deal with those challenges. And so this mental health aspect, particularly in this moment where, you know, we say athletes die two deaths, right? When their career, athletic career ends, and then that physical death, well, what are we doing now when so many more athletes are having a premature end to their career? 
How have we prepared them for seeing the other part of themselves and saying, I see something else that you could be doing. There's, there's another path for you. There's another calling. And so I think they're definitely uh, connected and there are things there that we've got to work together. Your question uh, to, to the father, Simeon, was fantastic. We need to think of how it works well when coaches, parents, and athletes together. And I think of these crises, right? As a high school coach, I had a father come to me after his son, you know, cursed us out after a game because he didn't play a lot. And the father who had been a thorn in our side approached us quickly and said, there's some things going on at home. There's some things going on with me and his mother. Now he didn't come to us beforehand, but he came to us after. And he looked at us as black men and said, can you help me? Can you give my son a second chance? That's when the relationship worked out well. The father was on board, trusted us with their kid and said, hey, I, we will take whatever consequence come with how my son treated you, but just don't kick him off the team. Don't cast him aside. Let's work together. I'm going to bring in one of my heroes here because I've seen, I've seen him out there. Everson, you there? Everson Walls. I am here, sir. How you Thank doing? Thank you, Charles? sir. Appreciate it. Because I want you to play off of what, what, what Dr. Brooks just talked about. The athlete dies two deaths. Your death as an athlete came at what I would consider a logical conclusion, a tremendous career, and you were able to kind of see it all the way through. Look, none of us want to end when it ends, right? But yours ended what seemed to be a very long, productive, you know, honored career. So you saw that, but I know that that still wasn't easy to make that transition that you go from that to, hey, now I'm Everson Wall's dad, father, you know, husband only as opposed to Everson Wall star cornerback safety in the NFL. Am I on track? Yeah, you are. As a matter of fact, um, first of all, let me thank uh, everyone for coming on uh, to this panel. This is amazing. I've been listening to everything you said. I've been wanting to jump in, but you hadn't called on your boy yet. So you had to mute me a little bit. Hey, but no, it's, it's all you, good. It's all you, good. You think I'm going to forget my hero? Come on. <laughs> no, I, but you guys, what they were saying such good things. Uh, you know, we just talked about, uh, uh, before I go on to the, the uh, two deaths, talked about a coach being important. Uh, to a, a kid. Well, I, I was lucky because my dad was my first coach. So, you know, he was able, he was really my first and best coach. He taught me everything about the, the, the fundamentals of each game I played. Taught me how to catch a ball. Once, you, once I was able to catch a ball, it's all over from there. And uh, one thing that I remember when I got to high school, I hadn't played football since my ninth grade year. And finally, I got a chance to play again my senior year. And it was kind of new to me. I had never been at that level of sports. So we're doing film work. I had never really done film work at that time. Uh, here I am 17 years old and I made a, a decent play on, on this uh, running back uh, that played for our arch rival. I think his name was Wayne Johnson, fast kid. And I was able to come up and, and make a play on this fast kid. And to me, it was just another play because that's what they asked me to do. And the coach stopped the video. Oh, at that time, sorry, real to real. We're talking 1977. So the coach, <laughs> the coach stopped the film and uh, he said, I want you guys to watch this. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, as he ran the play, here I come into the, into the screen. And I was like, whoa, he's talking about me. And he, to this day, I would say, except for maybe a Bill Parcells, maybe a Bill Belichick, to this day, he is the first and really uh, 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 consistent coach to give me credit for doing something. He called my name out in the film room, and that was the first time that had ever happened. So I was, I was like filled with pride, and it gave me a lot of inspiration to go on. Now, I wasn't one of those guys that needed that, but the fact that he said that for me, that means he went out of his way, and he could have just gone on through the video, through the, the film, as he, as he did. But, but uh, for him to call me out like that, it let me know something. That gave me a positivity. It gave me an acknowledgement, like, okay, I'm doing, I'm on the right track here. No one's ever said anything to me. My head's down, I'm grinding. 
But now someone said, hey, kid, you're doing good. And for him to say that, it changed everything. Uh, I'd only played that one year. And as you go on and, and all the great coaches that I've had, I was blessed, Charles. So to, to be able to say that I've had all of those great coaches and then to go through my career 13 years and to have the, 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 the success that I had, you're right. That, that was an acceptable death, as you might call it. Uh, and I'm okay with that. So that was a good thing. And once I did finally retire, uh, I had a lot of distractions. So I've got my two kids here, got my wife. So yeah, the, the distractions are there for you. Uh, and the healthy distractions, the fact that my kids uh, wanted to be athletes as well. So uh, I was able to kind of flow into that, just like Singletary was saying, you know, you got to know, you know, when, to, when to, 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 to be heavy on your kids and you have to know when to lighten up. And because of my career, I was able to know pretty much instinctively when you're supposed to push your kid and when you push them too much. And uh, I think I was able to perform that happy uh, balance. My daughter was, could have been a great athlete. And I could have been that dad that pushed her and pushed her and pushed her. But she wanted to be cute. She just wanted to be a girl. And so, you know, you can't make kids do what they don't want to do. And right now, she's a happy young lady. My son is a, a happy young man. All of them, both of them are well adjusted. And so as far as I'm concerned, you know, that, that first death was able to teach me a lot about how to deal with my kids, not just on the field, but just, you know, throughout this household. I got my son upstairs right now, so I know exactly what you guys are talking about. The pandemic brought him home. We had to have a little adjustment period, and it wasn't just me that had to make the adjustment. So those are the kind of things we've had to deal with. Thank God for my background, whether it's professionally or personally, that really allowed me to, to handle this situation uh, hopefully much better than most. So, Everson, you just went Godfather 3 on us there. You know, just when we got the kids kicked out of the house, the pandemic pulls them back oh, in. Pulls them back in. And, and I just want to pass on something to you from a dear friend and colleague, Larry Lundy, said your dad was his first coach, too, and taught him about life. So, you know, right. the, the, we're talking about legacies here. Coach Weaver, Lauren McKinney's on fire tonight. She's asking these great questions. So I'm going to come back to you with hers. She said, after everything we've talked about, is there a post-athlete transition plan for athletes? How do you aid them transitioning out of the athletic side into the life side? Because you've done both. You talking about me? No, it's about talking to Coach Weaver. Oh, okay. I think it starts early on because um, when you have student athletes, you want to really emphasize that it's, it's you know, athletes, athletics is important. Uh, being in games, getting your name out there is very important, but they need to take a self-assessment early on when they're starting their career to find what are some of the other um, career goals that they have? What are some of their other interests that, they're, that they like? And they want to try to have that assessment early on because you can sometimes forget. You think it's all about the lights and the fans and the claps and the awards. But again, things may not turn out for you as you had hoped. But so you need to be realistic about what else can I do in life? How can I contribute again in sports, working with other youth, be a coach, official, get in business, try and, and just tap into other avenues that they may not have thought of. So the transition, I think, begins early. So they're not, they don't need to be closed-minded about what their role is as an athlete, but they need to be always open to new ideas and try to see themselves in other uh, walks of life. That's what I would propose. Marcus, Simeon, as you were coming up through, and, and obviously, you know, your goal was to get to where you are, what did mom and dad talk to you about in addition to what you were doing athletically? Because I have a feeling it wasn't just simply, okay, every day we're just going to talk ball here. I get the sense that you had a well-rounded deal. Could you enlighten us, please? Well, I didn't get to play if I didn't do my homework, period. Um, you know, that was simple. You know, it, that got me to do my stuff. And, you know, they told me A's and B, we only, you know, they didn't say go out there and get straight A's. You have to get straight A's. But, you know, if a C came in, it wasn't quite, 
you know, it wasn't very acceptable. So that, that set my goals right there, A's and B's, get that work done so I can go outside and play. And um, we all know that's what I really wanted to do all day, but you start to, you know, find things that you actually like in school and, and subjects that you like, uh, reading, writing, math. I, I learned that I, I actually did like math. And, you know, it's that's hard for some, some at, student athletes to understand that there's things in school that you may really be passionate about, but at the end of the day, you're going to be out of sports longer than you're in sports. And those things are going to carry you the rest of your life, just those other passions. So that's what I feel that school, school is for. Um, school also provides you, um, you know, University of California, Berkeley provided me so many things, you know, so the school can provide you, um, you know, lifelong friends, I, all the friends from that team. Uh, that Half those guys were in my wedding, you know, some of those guys were in my wedding, uh, people that I just, you know, love. So um, it goes hand in hand. I think school was the most important thing so I could go out there and play. See, that's part of identity. That's legacy, right? So my next question, Michael Davis, I need you prepared, okay? Coach Singletary, I need you prepared. I'm starting with Dr. Brooks. Finances, hard on everyone. The way we do things now, how many times have we lamented driving past an open park and no one's playing ball? But if it's a travel team, if it's an organized sport and money's got to be paid, that's where our kids end up. How much of that financial tie-in goes into relationships between athletes, parents, and what the parents do or how they react to their athlete because money may be on the line or having been paid for them to participate? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a great question. Uh, we have a pay for play model here in our country. Uh, the youth sports industry is up over $18 billion. Uh, you know, I, I spent some time calculating how much I spent on my sons as they play travel ball. And, you know, it's nothing to be paying for them to go to training, to go to, and that might be strength and conditioning coach, a particular training coach who's giving them techniques on their own sport, then you're paying your fees. So there's clearly a haves and have nots, right? If you have the money, uh, you can give your kids an opportunity. If you don't, you better be in basketball or football where it's subsidized by the sneaker companies. But if you're a parent paying all this money, then you want outcomes, right? You want to return on your investment. And so that can sour your relationship with your child you spend all this money on them and then they don't have the love, right? So when you look at this, as Father Simeon said, hey, I wanted to make sure they, that they had that love, that they developed that on their own. Well, imagine you put, you know, you, you buy into that sales pitch, you know, that sometimes you get from these trainers, invest your 50 to $70,000 now, and this will save you on paying for college tuition. And then your kid decides that they, don't want to do that sport anymore. And here you've sunk all this money, right? It's hard for you to, to separate those when money is hard to come by. Uh, so I think it definitely sours it when you're talking about coaches. You know, I, I, as, a, as a travel ball coach, I said, those kids who really don't have a chance to make it uh, on the floor, their parents are usually the first one writing a check <laughs> because they know that money talks. And so, you know, even that has an impact. Parents pay money and they want their coach they're buying a coach in some instances, right? So our model makes it tough. A pay for play model excludes kids from certain opportunities. It adds pressure to the kids. The parents want a return on their investment and that sometimes sours the relationship with their child as well as the coach. So we really wanna be careful uh, with how we are investing, uh, but our communities have suffered. And so part of the problem is and this is one of the things, the impacts of COVID that we're not really thinking about. In our community, where so many of our coaches are volunteers, we have lost so many people due to COVID. It's impacted our community disproportionately. We don't know how many coaches we have lost. We are not on that other side to know how that's going to impact our community and youth sports. And so it's something for us to look out for. Uh, but this money thing is a real issue, as you said, Charles. Coach Singletary, I'm a parent and I'm 
you know, you hear me jumping on my kid after you've coached him, right? You're coming around the corner after practice and I'm all over my kid. As much money as I put in you, that's the best effort I see. How come you're not playing? How do you work through that as a coach? How do I work through that as a coach? Um, I think first and foremost, can you hear me okay? Certainly. Okay. I, I think first and foremost, um, it should never be taken, in my opinion, it should never be taken into account how much money I'm spending on my kid. I think that um, that's my fault. I think I have to recognize if my kid wants to play, then I'm willing to spend the money. And we have to sit down as parent and, and kid and say, uh, son, daughter, do you want to play this sport? Yes, dad, I want to play it. I, okay, you know what, here are the expectations, let, let's go. Um, but I, I, um, I just think it's really important. There are so many parents that, that are spending money on their kids and they have an expectation. I think Mike Davis talked about this earlier. They have, the parent have, has an expectation, but the kid does not. The kid does not want to play. And uh, the parent is hoping at some point in time a light comes on and it doesn't. Um, so you're angry at the kid and, and the kid is frustrated because he doesn't want to play anyways. So, um, as a coach, if, if I, if I have ever seen a situation where I can recognize that a kid doesn't want to play, I'm going to tell that parent so that I can, I can, I can help them understand where my expectations are. And, and, um, because I don't want to, as a coach, take the joy away from the other kids by trying to make this kid fit in or make him like the game when they don't, uh, when he or she does not like the game. And, and it's a tough place to put a coach, but uh, depending on how young the kid is, um, I think it's the coach's responsibility to step up and, and, and speak to the parents and say, you know what, I'm, I'm not a babysitter. Your kid doesn't like the game. Tell me what you want to do. And, um, those are hard conversations, but I think they're very necessary. Michael Davis, you see this come through your building, I'm sure. It's not just everything is beautiful and you're helping and everyone's on the right path. You see all of this. Yep. What are your thoughts? Because I want to hear from you and I want to make sure we have the right time because we want to hear from Kevin Williamson before we conclude tonight. Absolutely. Uh, you know, just taking from Dr. Brooks and, and Coach Singletary, I, I think it goes back to, again, how our parents identify the sport with their kids. Uh, is, this as a way, is this a way out? Am I getting a way out by way of my son and my daughter based on that professional sport? Then you keep track of the ROI, the return on investment, if that is the expectation that you have in your household. Uh, at the same time, if that's not in alignment with what the kid feels and that's not his passion, you're going to drive that relationship to a different place. I think as coaches and what I've seen from my perspective is that it's our job to recalibrate, right, the expectation that you see with dad and mom and also with the, the, the student athlete. And that's a hard, like Coach said, that's a hard conversation to have because um, you're kind of stuck in the middle but you're like the agent of the parent, right? You're, you're trying to really bridge them together for the long haul because percentage wise, you're not gonna make it to the league. You're not gonna be the Mike Singletary's. You're not gonna be the Tim Browns and Everson Walls. You're gonna have to find that new person as Dr. Brooks talked about, who is this person? Uh, Coach Weaver, same thing, starting that process early in the game, being exposed to different things. I think the big thing that I think is about exposure if these kids are not exposed, but just to one thing and what mom and dad are showing them, and this is their identity, it's hard to see themselves do something else and want to do something else at that point. So I think that all goes into what I see in my building is the lack of exposure that our kids have outside of the written narrative that we have as a country that markets can only be successful at professional baseball. And, you know, Damian Simeon only can be successful as a Canadian football player in the CFL. Like, that's not true. But the, the, the system makes us believe that. And so we don't open ourselves up for exposure to allow us to recalibrate those things for our kids. And us as coaches have to have the awareness 
in the holistic view to do so. That's what I see. Mr. Simeon, with, with your son on the panel here tonight and you having been a former professional athlete yourself, collegiate athlete, the whole deal, and now the well-rounded parent, what do, you know, what do you have to offer all of us out there on our journey, creating that identity and legacy for our kids? Your best practices, your best advice before I bring in Kevin Williamson. You know what? I've heard a whole lot tonight, and um, I'm I, I'm kind of torn because I, I, everything everybody's saying has been right on point. And I think back to my my own journey, my own growing up playing sports. I was so all I had was tunnel vision. I wanted to be either a pro baseball player or a pro basketball player. Football came at a later point in my life, but I'm talking about I had uh, straight tunnel vision. You guys talked about uh, the athlete dying to two deaths. I'm still going through that at 50 years old. You know what I mean? I haven't accepted, well, physically, obviously, I can't play anymore. Mentally, I still think I got one more route left in me, but I <laughs> know that ain't gonna happen. But my point of it is, um, I'm glad my kids now, they see, they can see outside the box. I was unfortunate. I never was able to get that growing up. Say, hey, what if I don't make it? What else is out there? But I'm glad that my, you know, my kids, you know, Marcus, my two daughters, they, they see outside the box. I, I learned a lot tonight that I never, I never got that. You know, and I, I, like I said, I'm still going through that the two death uh, thing we talked about. <laughs> but Mr. But, Simeon, I, I know you're saying that, mm -hmm. but we've got a young man on this panel that's a shining example that maybe you weren't just strictly tunnel vision and how you raised him. Mm -hmm. So when did some of that light start to come in for you, even though, look, I'm 56 and in my dreams, I can go out there. <laughs> But I do realize when I roll over in bed, I'm liable to pull a hammy. So yeah. that's not going to happen. But you you developed a light in order to raise these children this way. How when did that start to leak in for you? I think it it started again once I once I saw and I, I keep you know uh, hitting this point when I realized how much my kids loved it and they loved it to the point to where it wasn't going to um, it wasn't, it wasn't going to absorb them totally, but they had enough love to stick and work hard at it on their own. So I think that's when I realized that, hey, you know what? They, they, they can do this without that, that, that real big push coming from, a, coming from me. Because I, I got some really good friends whose kids who, quote unquote, should make it or should have made it, but they didn't because they had that dad who pushed too hard and they fell out of love with their with their sport they were in. So I, I think it hit me when I kind of just was able to sit back and be that proud dad that just folded his hands in the stands and just, you know, when my son or daughter out there running up and down, the I just shook my head and was like, yeah, I said it to myself. That's my boy or that's my girl. <laughs> but Can I, I jump in? That, huh? Can I jump in? That? Go ahead. Right, so and for me, what I got from you was, you know, you, you watched all my games. Um, if you saw something, you were going to tell me. I don't think that every night you were sitting there, you know, like, okay, you told me to be aggressive. You told me the, the things that, you know, from uh, the outside eyes looking at the game that I needed and that maybe a coach saw but didn't tell me the right way because they're not my dad. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think that, we talk about parents um, helping their kids. And when you have a dad who played professionally and played division one football, you need those kinds of, you know, words because sometimes the coaches we have as, as young kids, maybe they played high school, but they weren't all professional athletes. Um, so that's what really helped me. You were my hero. You were, you know, I wanted to play pros cause you did. I wanted to go to Cal cause you did. So when you told me something about, you know, my, my game or what you saw, I listened and I went to work on it. And you know, that's what I got from it. I, I know, Charles, you were trying to get that out of him. 
but that yep. I want to help you, and that's what he Thank did. Thank you. For me. Thank you. See, this is this is what a good son does. He he recognizes. And real quick, Marcus, him telling you these things, I have a sense that it's the manner in how he told you that helped you along, as opposed to what we hear from others, where maybe it's berating that child. Am, am I am I anywhere close? No, you're right. I mean, it, I think that's where I get a lot of my you know my calm personality um, is from him. You know, just just laid back and that's all I needed. I didn't, I, I never needed to be yelled at because I felt like, um, I felt like I had a decent work, work ethic and it's gotten better as I've become an adult because you understand that there's more on the line as an adult and as a parent, and you have to work hard or it's over. Um, but the, I think that I accept, I received that well, the way he gave it to me. Dr. Brooks, I hate to do this, but I need one minute from you. Okay, summarize legacy, identity, and how we can all get there the best way. And I know that's loaded, but go. All right. So I, I think I, particularly as a coach, we learn once we've done it right, we've gotten to that championship in particular, we're able to work backwards. We like to have that, that hindsight view. So I think when we look at it, let's think of all those folks who have left a legacy with us. What are those personal stories, those personal heroes, those people that have taught us how to live and walk our lives? What we see here is that there are people who had purpose, that they knew who they were. They made it clear what they stood for and they were consistent in doing that. Often these people, you know, they showed love to us, whether it was explicit with those words or it was in their actions, the way they cared for us, the way they talk to us, the way that they paid attention. And so what we want for our parents and for our kids is for there to be that example, for them to have that love between one another, for parents to be able to express it in the myriad ways in which they do, and for our kids to learn how to receive it. That even when someone is being a little bit hard on you, as we say, that if they're doing it within love, that this is a learning opportunity. So I think legacy at the end of the day, it's about how our ancestors have set this model for us. Paul Robeson talked about being a patriot and we have allowed others to take on this term of patriotism as though it is only held for certain folks. We are, all of us come from these ancestors who built this land, who built this country. And so we are all patriots, right? The role models have been there, they continue and we've got to continue to follow that lead that they have provided for us. So I think legacy at the end of the day always comes back to what we will remember and how it helps us to lead our lives on a daily basis. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. Michael Davis, I know you wanna end with a sizzle reel, but we gotta get Kevin in. If he goes long, I apologize to you, but Kevin Williamson, alum, still, still educating. The floor is yours, sir. Um, pleasure to be here. I heard a lot of great things. Um, a lot of great questions too. Again, I'm Kevin Williamson. I actually moved here in 2009 and that's where I met coach Davis. He was my defensive coordinator at Parrish. I moved here from California by way of Chicago, originally from Chicago, but just wanted to give my evolution through the program. Obviously we've been at this for over a decade and just to see a full circle from a man who mentored me. And now I'm in a position in a seat to, one, professionally as a strength conditioning coach, mentor myself, but also contribute to the program, contribute to Ethos as a, as a mentor and as an edu educator, is everything, honestly, that I've, I've lived for. I knew coming from the south side of Chicago that I, I wanted to give back. I don't know how that would be, what vessel that would be through, but education is it. Just provide education, provide resources, and understanding as to who you are, what your legacy is, what your identity is, uh, is everything that I believed in. And that's how I made my transition into strength and conditioning, just giving athletes specifically the resources and the tools that they need to be successful and have longevity in their sport. But just the understanding of mental fitness and mental performance and nutritional wellness, all the things that I look to incorporate just to provide our younger generation with the tools that they need to be successful because it's the things that I had to learn through hardship, through injury and through it's adversity what it took to be successful so hearing from you all was, was 
great uh, having a mentor and having an educator like Mike Davis has been great. And just wanted to yeah, share my two. Kevin, thank you so thank you so much for those great words. Michael, I know we're up against it. If you Michael Davis, if you would tell everyone where they can go and, and see this see your the see the sizzle reel to show what ethos is about and what you're trying to do. And on that, if you can give us that information, I thank the panel. I thank everyone for attending. But Michael, give us that info, please. You got on mute. Thank you. Uh, I want people to go to www.ethosvillage.com. Uh, you can see exactly what we're doing. We're creating this in safe haven to have these tough conversations, to allow us to grow our legacies, to, to look at generational uh, wisdom as a way to help us really guide our kids and guide our families. Um, so that, that's really what we're doing. Uh, ethosvillage.com. Uh, again, sign up, register. Uh, we have an Ethos uh, Village uh, TV YouTube channel. And then lastly, we have uh, something for mental health uh, campaign called Almost There. So you'll see a lot about that, bringing attention to mental health. Uh, you're one step away from doing everything that you want to do. You just have to make that decision and have exposure. Thank you so much. And I told everyone tonight, Everson Walls is my hero. I believe this is the third one I've been honored to host, moderate. Everyone who's been on the panel, who's participated, I've gained nothing but heroes along the way. <laughs> I thank each and every one of you for your wisdom, for your knowledge, for your time and for putting it all out there for the rest of us to glean and learn and incorporate into ourselves. 2020 is almost over. 2021's got to be better. And it will be because of everyone who's participating in this. Thank you all very much and good night.